Good morning to all of you. We're delighted to see so many people here. We really have a great program. Uh, the Lucian Leap Institute Plenary has traditionally uh, presented um, our current thinking about some of the key strategic issues in patient safety, both so we can share with you where, where, we're, where we think we're going, and equally important to get feedback from you about whether we're on the right track and your ideas. And so we would welcome uh, comments and feedback um, by, any, by any medium <laughs> that you choose to use at any time. Our subject today is on the issue of uh, is it time to get tough about patient safety? It focuses on an aspect of the just culture that we don't talk about very much, which is what are the consequences when a person uh, deliberately uh, and repeatedly uh, breaks the rules, which we think are so important. Uh, so it, it, is, uh, it should be a very interesting debate. It will be a co point counterpoint between two of our leaders in patient safety, and I don't think there will be any lack of, uh, of uh, sparks and interest. I continue to be, um, I wouldn't say amazed, but uh, certainly pleased and, and uh, gratified that we continue to attract to patient safety uh, people who are bright, uh, committed, and work hard. Like all of you here and thousands of others who aren't here, uh, and I think that is the, that's what's going to make it happen. Uh, that's what's making it happen now. Uh, no one exemplifies those characteristics more than our two speakers today. Both of them have been leaders in patient safety almost from the very beginning, or from the very beginning. Uh, both of them have inspired hundreds of people to work in patient safety. And, uh, and both of them are people who are committed and make significant contributions of themselves and have been leaders, uh, particularly in being tough, setting a high bar and expecting, uh, expecting us to exceed it. Uh, Bob Wachter is a professor of medicine and uh, associate chief of medicine at University of California in San Francisco. Uh, recently stepped down as chair of the Board of Internal Medicine, uh, best known to, I'm sure, most people in the room as the conceptual leader uh, of the, the idea of a hospitalist and coined the term hospitalist and, of course, has been a major leader in that movement, a whole new field in healthcare that's made a huge difference. He's also a prolific writer. Uh, and, again, many of you know that he is the author not only of one of the best books for laymen about patient safety, but clearly the leading textbook on patient safety that so many of us use for our students. Um, Bob uh, is a, a, a recipient of the John Eisenberg Award in 2004 uh, and has been really a major voice for patient safety, both in terms of government websites that he, that he manages and, and in terms of uh, speaking and writing on the issue all the time. Um, Greg Meyer is uh, Chief Clinical Officer at Partners Healthcare in Boston, um, and he is the uh, uh, incoming chair of the Board of Directors of National Patient Safety Foundation, as, as, uh, as you all know. Uh, he is uh, currently the clinic, uh, Chief Clinical Officer for Partners Healthcare, and he, uh, but he has a long history in, in patient safety, number of years uh, as the Director of Quality Improvement and Safety at AHRQ. After that, he was the Director of Quality and Safety at the Mass General Hospital, and more recently uh, was the Chief Clinical Officer at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, so we have two outstanding leaders uh, who are certainly well qualified, so sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. So it is my great honor to moderate this debate, um, and this will truly be a debate. Neither presenter has shared with the other what they will say or has re rehearsed questions and answers with the other. 
Also, to be clear, the debaters may represent positions that they actually disagree with, but only for the purpose of debate are taking that position. The disclaimer. Um, we believe that the various positions taken represent real-world scenarios that all of you may find yourselves in, and we hope the discussion will help clarify your thinking about this important topic. We will be asking the audience for questions during the debate via our audience response system that you should have at your seats. During the debate, you and the audience will have the ability to tweet questions to hashtag NPSF16 underscore debate as well. Please begin to tweet your questions once the debate begins and let us know if the question is directed to a particular speaker. Okay, let's begin the debate. Hold on, we're getting our question up here. The specific issue being debated today is the following. Certain safety practices should be inviolable and transgressions should result in penalties, potentially including fines, suspensions, and firing. We have an initial starter question for the audience. Get our first audience response question, please. Do you agree or disagree with the statement I just read, that certain safety practices should be inviolable and transgressions should result in penalties, potentially including fines, suspensions, and firing? Uh, push A if you agree, B if you disagree. Okay, so 79% agree. Dr. Meyer, you have your work cut out for you. Indeed. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> okay, so uh, our first speaker will be Bob, who will be starting with an opening argument in favor or in the agree category of this statement. Thank you, Tejal. I actually feel like I have my work cut out for me because uh, uh, I, I can only lose ground. Uh, <laughs> It is, uh, it's an honor to be here and, uh, and, and take this on. I think it's an extraordinarily interesting and important topic that all of us grapple with in our, in our day jobs. It is a little bit scary, both because of the uh, size of the audience and how much I hold all of you in esteem, uh, and the fact that I'm debating Greg. Uh, we had a rehearsal last night where we didn't talk about what we were going to talk about, uh, but we did obviously know we would debate each other, and he told me uh, several things. Uh, one, that uh, he had been a colonel in the Air Force. <laughs> the second, that uh, in that role he was trained to kill. <laughs> and the third is we were trying to sort out how the, the stadium, would, uh, how the, uh, the podium would look here. Uh, he said we should move Tejal's podium back so that I could be in his, quote, line of sight. <laughs> You remember. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounded very much like something Jack Bauer would say on 24. Uh, it's also a little bit of a role reversal because Greg is obviously the macho military type. And as my kids like to say when they look at my music collection that includes uh, Barry Manilow and a lot of show tunes, <laughs> uh, Dad, why are you such a girly man? So uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable for me to take the, uh, the tough loves uh, part of this debate, but I will because I, I actually believe that it's right. Uh, let me tell you why. I first got interested in patient safety uh, when, in 1994, I read an article by Lucian Leap called Error in Medicine, and it introduced uh, the concept, one I'd really never heard before or thought about before, that uh, errors were mostly manifestations of dysfunctional systems and most errors were committed by good, competent, caring people trying to do the right thing. And as I began thinking about that, it actually made a, a, a good amount of sense, but uh, I was busy doing the rest of my life and I didn't really focus on it very much. But I did read some of the foundational readings in patient safety, and one of the key ones uh, was uh, by Jim Reason. So as most of you know, Jim Reason is a clinical psychologist based in Manchester, England, who wrote about error uh, well before the patient safety field, Reason studied how errors happen in complex organizations, so studied space shuttle crashes and, uh, and train derailments and Three Mile Island and things like that. 
and he introduced me to something called the Swiss cheese model, which you're all well aware of, and, and I think one of the manifestations of the progress we're making in the field is that when I ask audiences now about, you know about the Swiss cheese model, pretty much everybody raises their hand. Uh, when I first read about the Swiss cheese model, it was an epiphany to me, the idea that, that in complex organizations like the ones we all work in, most errors really are individual glitches, but that's not really the core problem. It's not the root cause. The root cause is that the protections the organization has built are leaky, and that on this terrible day with really bad karma, all the holes align, <clears throat> and the error makes it through. Uh, one of the reasons that was such an epiphany to me was I work at uh, University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. It's a terrific place. Uh, U.S. News continues to think we're one of the top 10 hospitals in the country. Uh, the methodology we know is a little bit silly, but we pl plaster it on every billboard in San Francisco the minute it comes out. Uh, but one of the things that I am blessed with is I look around and look at my colleagues, I look at the docs and the nurses and the pharmacists at our place, and they are spectacularly good, and they are careful, and they're, they care deeply, and they work their tails off, and we have errors all the time. And so that made very real to me the idea that this can't be all about bad people, it's mostly about good people uh, working in dysfunctional systems. The other reason I think the, the no blame and it's the system approach was so important was in the early years of patient safety where it was vital to get doctors engaged in this work. If you said to a doctor in the late 90s, we're going to talk about <clears throat> medical mistakes and we really want you on board and I want your active engagement. As soon as you say medical mistake to a doctor, there's this little ink blot thing that, that, that starts and all they can think about is malpractice. And, and from then on, it's la, 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 they're not listening. And so the idea of focusing on no blame, it's not anyone's fault, it's the system, was an incredibly important point, both because it's mostly correct and because it was politically correct, and I don't mean that in the PC way, I mean that in the, it was a politically astute way of getting started because it got engagement of clinicians, particularly physicians, in a way that I think other approaches would not have worked. So, that made sense to me, and it still makes a lot of sense to me, and I believe it was the right response in the early days. Several years ago, though, I began to recognize that we were invoking the idea of no blame, and it's the system, in situations, in pretty much every situation when there was harm or risky behavior. And the one where it really struck home was seven or eight years ago when we all began to focus on hand hygiene. And I would go into a hospital and, and visit, and I would ask them what their hand hygiene rate was. And they would say, well, it's 55%. And I'd say, well, what are you trying to do about that? And they'd say, well, we're trying to improve the system. And then I'd walk around the building, and there was a gel dispenser every two feet. And on every wall was a picture of some clinical leader cleaning their hands and looking like they were having a party. <laughs> and on every computer screensaver was a picture of some nasty pussy wound. And I had to say that when they came back to me and said, we're working on improving the system, my BS detector went off. Because I looked around and I said, the system's pretty good. Not perfect, but the system looks like it's pretty good. And it dawned on me that really the nature of the problem was a lack of accountability. And I realized this in my own hospital, that I would get suspended from the medical staff if I didn't get my PPD or I didn't sign my discharge summaries but I could not clean my hands for the next five years and absolutely nothing would happen to me. And that just struck me as wrong, wrong in, in all dimensions of the word. So I'd sometimes come back and ask the leaders of quality and safety, so, all right, it looks like your system's pretty good. Obviously, it can always be a little better, but what are you doing about it? <clears throat> and what do you do about people who refuse to follow reasonable safety rules? And they said, oh, we have a just culture. And I said, that's terrific, what does that mean? And they would show me the algorithm. They would show me Reason's algorithm or David Marx's algorithm. And it was very pretty and made pretty clear what you do in different situations. And I'd say, that sounds, sounds nice. What do you do if your head of CT surgery or neurosurgery says, I don't like the idea of a timeout. I think it's kind of silly. So I don't do that. And when I posed that question, they would kind of look down at the floor and shuffle their feet. Because in fact, they weren't doing very much about that situation because it's really hard. But I think we've all become enablers of that kind of situation, of allowing people, and in some cases only certain people, to break certain safety rules. 
And the message it sends to the entire organization and the entire field, I think, is, is quite profound. So I believe that it's time for us to recalibrate uh, our approach, and that's why I'm comfortable taking this point of view. A few years ago, I had the extraordinary opportunity to give the Jim Reason lecture in the United Kingdom, and that was equally as intimidating as speaking in the, for the Lucian Leap Institute with Lucian sitting in the front row. And as I was preparing the talk, I went back and reread the book Managing the Risks of Organizational Accidents, Reason's foundational work from 1997. And I asked myself, had the founder of the Swiss cheese model ever said anything about this idea of how you deal with transgressions? And in fact, on page 195, he had. And Reason wrote, a no-blame culture is neither feasible nor desirable. A small proportion of human unsafe acts are egregious and warrant sanctions, severe ones in some cases. A blanket amnesty on all unsafe acts would lack credibility and would be seen to oppose nat natural justice. What is needed is a just culture, an atmosphere of trust in which people are encouraged, even rewarded, for providing essential safety information, but in which there, there are also clear about where the line must be drawn between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. I don't quote Henry Kissinger a lot, <laughs> but I will now, because Kissinger once said, weakness is provocative, and he was right. I want to be clear, no blame is usually the correct response to most errors and unsafe acts. It mostly works. But by invoking it inappropriately and by invoking it all the time when we're dealing with acts that are not no blame, like failing to clean your hands, I think we're harming more and more patients. And more, probably more importantly, we're also losing the trust and credibility of those who look at us for leadership in patient safety. So by failing to clean our hands, failing to do timeouts, by engaging in disruptive behavior, and by us not doing anything about it, I believe, as Kissinger said, we are being provocative, and it's time we stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and I want to remind again the audience that if you have questions, you can tweet them to hashtag NPSF16 underscore debate. We're now going to have our next audience response question. What is your response to Dr. Wachter's argument? A, no change in your opinion. B, reinforced your initial opinion. And C, changed your opinion. OK. A lot of reinforcement. As I said, Greg has his work cut out for him. Um, so, Greg, I'm going to pass it over to you for your opening comments. Wonderful. So I have a steep hill to climb. Let me begin by making sure that I don't get trapped by the patient safety police. And so, just for the record, Bob, um, <laughs> just, so, so I'm going through my, my checklist here. Um, so, Bob, I'm greeting you with a sympathetic smile. <laughs> Tejal, you look great, and I love what you did with the stage. <laughs> I'm Greg Meyer. That was my time out. <laughs> Just one more thing before we get started. I want to make sure, Bob, um, do you see this? I do. No, do you really see it? I saw it. You really see it? I do. Okay, I want to make, do you really see it? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Um, this is my Fluvax at a station right here, okay? So, am I free to speak? You can speak. Thank Go ahead. you. Thank you. So, I, I think that, um, that my, my opponent's arguments, I think, were, were quite strong, but I think the defense of the proposition may be fine, but I would argue that my um, opposition is actually divine. Let me explain. <laughs> the question before this house, before you this morning, is which approach is likely to move us further towards creating a world where patients and those who care for them are free from harm? Is it accountability? Or is it to continue focusing on a blame-free culture? Well, let us begin where we all can agree. Criminal is criminal, and we have a system for that. That when there are criminal acts that take place, whether or not it's Dr. Conrad Murray providing anesthesia in a patient's home, or it's a physician treating a patient while intoxicated, there are laws to deal with that, 
and we should use them. We should not shy away from them. We should rely on the system. I agree with the second fact. That is, the work of my worthy opponent in his own research has demonstrated that the public demand for fines, suspensions, and firings is high. But acquiescing to public demands for justice, to hang them high, will undermine culture. It won't build it. So I beg you to oppose the proposition beyond those two points because I think it's a danger to patient safety. It is so because it ignores our humanity, it flies in the face of safety science, it's impractical, it doesn't work, it drives the wrong behaviors, and it's a distraction. But other than that, Bob's proposition is terrific. <laughs> so let me begin. It ignores our humanity. Alexander Pope, the 18th century poet, essay on criticism, is familiar to all for the phrase, to err is human, to forgive divine. I do stand on the side of the divine this morning because make no mistake, what my worthy opponent is peddling is old wine in a new bottle. It is the bitter old wine of blame that cannot be covered up with the new label of, quote, accountability. There are really only two types of people we must recognize our humanity. When it comes to making mistakes, to forgetting to do that hand hygiene, to skipping through that one part of the checklist that morning, there are only two groups of people out there. There are those that have and those that will. It's part of our human nature. We are human, we make mistakes, and when we are fearful, when we're worried that somebody's watching us and gonna punish us, we let that fear push us further over on the performance anxiety curve. And when we do so, we make more mistakes, not improving. The proposition also ignores safety science. Pope's essay was notable for two additional quotes that I think are germane to our debate this morning. The first was a little learning is a dangerous thing. When we think about what we're trying to do in patient safety, we need to continuously learn and we recognize that being open about our failings is the first and most important step to getting that process going. Brain blame will create distrust and it will slow the movement down. Pope had an additional quote. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I do believe that is self-explanatory in the case of my esteemed opponent's logic, but with <laughs> that said, I think we can remind ourselves of what H.L. Mencken said so long ago, that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And accountability is clear and simple and wrong. Patient safety is complex, and we need to treat it as such. The proposition would not work. We've had decades of torts that have had blame. Has that made us safer? Has the medical malpractice system made us safer over the last five or six decades? We also have evidence. We all celebrate our aviation safety reporting system. It's been emulated around the world, and the callback newsletter is something we all aspire to in terms of the way they share openly about those hazardous, hazardous events. New Zealand was one of the countries that emulated it. They set up a system, it got up, and it was running, and it was working well, but they decided to divulge the identity of one of the reporters. In so doing, they shut the system down. No one reported anymore. Everyone was afraid. Was the value of divulging the name of that pilot worth the five years it took to restart the safety reporting system? I would argue no. The proposition is also impractical. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Comes to us from Proverbs. Would his childlike approach warranted to improve patient safety? Who's gonna cast the first stone? Whenever we create such rules, as you know, there are gonna be three ways to approach it. The first way is to change the underlying process, to do it right, to make doing the right thing the easy thing, and that takes time, energy, and resources. But no, make, make no mistake, there are two other ways to ensure that we're complying with whatever rule we're gonna hold people accountable for. The first is to game it, to just drive things other ground, to check the box, done. The second is to create unsustainable efforts, to throw resources that we can't keep there for the long run. Both of those are shortcuts, and driving to accountability will make us take those shortcuts. 
It's also important to ask, where does it stop? The initial three that Dr. Wachter and his colleagues have proposed, hand hygiene, preoperative checklist, and flu vaccine, all seem quite defensible of places where we should start with accountability. But what comes next, and where does it stop? I was involved with the patient safety incident. There was egregious behavior. It was repeated, and it was deliberate. Let me explain. We had a patient who was undergone surgery at the Mass General Hospital, and in their post-op recovery, they had an event that led to a significant bleed. The requirement was that for any transfusion to be given, that it had to be signed, full name, with title, by two nurses. And when we had an accreditor come in for review, they found that we violated that policy 40 times. 40 times. We did not have... There were just initials on the units. That was deliberate, and it was repeated. The patient walked out the door because those 40 times were for a single patient who, after his transplant, was having a major bleeding event. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is if those nurses were going to be held accountable for the fact that they did not sign their full name, would they have been as responsive to getting those units of blood into that patient as quickly as they needed to? Where does it stop, and who decides? There are going to be emergent exceptions to any of our rules, but where do you draw the line? Hamlet said, nothing is either good or bad. It is thinking that makes it so. We need to think, and the thoughtful recognize that punishment is not the route to improve safety. It also drives the wrong behaviors. It's easier to police than provide resources. Rules-based behaviors are one of the biggest sources of safety events in recent analysis. And what are we driving towards with this issue of, quote, accountability? We compete with harm. We need to keep focusing on that folk, uh, on harm. And it's easier to punish than it is to put resources into making sure that we create a less harmful environment for our patients. When times are tight, reverting to punishment as a quick, expedient means of ensuring that we are moving forward on patient safety has a lot of attraction for our colleagues because it's a lot easier than educating, than building systems, than removing barriers. But it's the wrong way to go forward. And finally, it's a distraction. The proposition is a distraction from the real barriers to patient safety. The real barriers to patient safety aren't bad people. They are production pressure, and they are the lack of systems. Let us not forget it. We need to spend our time on improving those rather than on counting checklists, rather than on policing, rather than on Big Brother. I started with a pope, and I'll end with a leap. The single greatest impediment to error prevention is that we punish people for making mistakes. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, we're ready for our next audience response question. What is your response to Dr. Meyer's argument? A, move toward Dr. Wachter. B, move toward Dr. Meyer. And C, no change in your position. Mm hmm the plot thickens. So 36% of you had some shift towards Greg's arguments. OK, we are now ready for the audience participation uh, portion. And I will be reading your tweeted questions to the speakers. One speaker will respond for two minutes. The other will have the opportunity for a 30-second rebuttal. The first question, I'm going to give this to Greg. Do we resist accountability because it's personal, requiring us to acknowledge past failures and commit to acting differently? I think in the grounds of, of trying to improve safety, that my resistance to, quote, accountability isn't because I don't believe that we should be held accountable for actions in some instances. I just believe they should be clearly defined. And again, as I said earlier, we have a criminal justice system to deal with those extreme exceptions, 
But when we think about how we're going to make progress moving forward in patient safety, that the value of being people feeling comfortable and bringing forth their concerns, speaking up freely, far outweighs any marginal benefit that we're going to get from the hand hygiene, from the checklist, or from the flu vaccine police. This is real politic. This is looking at how we're going to make progress more quickly on the vision of the National Patient Safety Foundation. And I would argue that focusing our efforts on accountability at this juncture, very early in our safety journey, I think would be a distraction, would slow us down, and potentially poison the well for us to move forward. Bob? Well, it's interesting that uh, Greg frames this as being very early in our patient safety juncture. Uh, as I said, I got interested in patient safety reading Lucian's paper, and that was 20 years ago. And the IOM report was 15 years ago. So we've been at this for a while. I think there's a false dichotomy being established here that basically says there are acts that are criminal and we have the justice system to take care of them. And Greg's used the word police a number of times. Uh, and then there's everything else. There's system thinking and, and no blame. And I just like to think that, as Greg says, this is a complex issue and our response needs to be equally complex and nuanced. I don't think the world exists at those poles. I think the world exists with lots of gradations, and there are things that we can do that go beyond the criminal justice system, that don't invoke policing, but that do make clear that there are certain lines, and I believe we've just been permissive too long and allowed people to step over those lines. And they, of course, realize, as we all do, that if I can step over that line once, I can keep on getting away with it, or if I follow the rules and follow, uh, stay on the right side of those lines, that somehow I'm being taken advantage of by my colleagues who choose not to do that. So I don't think the world is quite as clean as these only two choices. I think we're smarter than that and more nuanced than that. Thank you. And let me remind the debaters, 30 seconds for rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, this next question is for you. Please discuss the difference between willful misconduct and mistakes? Well, it's a good question, and I think it's, it is at the core of what we're talking about. Uh, so willful misconduct is someone choosing to ignore a safety rule or standard, that they know it's right and that they, uh, they know what the rule is, they, they understand where that line is, and they choose to go over it. Now, there's nuance here, too. It's tricky because sometimes people will do that because they're doing a workaround around a system that is flawed. And I think that it's important, I think I agree with Greg on this, that if our instinct is to blame, our instinct is to invoke accountability all the time, I think we will uh, we'll be making errors. But there are times where willful misconduct is, someone knows what the rule is, one does not have to do a workaround to get the work done, and chooses to avoid it for a variety of reasons. Uh, mistakes are human. People make errors because they don't have the knowledge base that they need or, uh, or the situation is one that's confusing, and I think they, that engenders a different response. And I think we're not here talking about what you do with an innocent mistake. We're talking about someone who understands the rules. The system is a good, solid system. It's been thought about carefully by good people, and someone does willfully choose to ignore that rule. Greg? The notion that we will spend our time well by trying to sort out whether or not something willful or not, I think it's a fallacy. Time is short, the work is hard. We have much work to do, and if I think about how I want to spend my day, how much of it is sorting out whether or not something was willful or whether or not it was just a mistake? How many people would that take? Is that the right use of our resources? Or instead, should we move forward? Should we be able to understand our frailties, accept them, and learn from them. This is about learning. Thank you. Our next question is coming up on the screen, so give me one second here. Um, I think I'm gonna give this one to Bob again. Is patient outcome the main factor in defining an inviolable patient safety action? Can you repeat that, Tetra? Can sure. Is patient outcome? Is patient outcome the main factor in defining an inviolable patient safety action? 
So that's a good question, and I think the answer is no. And I think hand hygiene is a good example of that, where one of the reasons why people sometimes choose to not clean their hands is the outcome is never clear to them. Even when a patient develops a healthcare-associated infection, it's very unusual that you can say that was because this particular person didn't clean their hands. In fact, most times you don't know that. You, there's no way of looking at that outcome and going back and investigating and saying it was this one's person, uh, one person's choice not to clean their hands. So I think that becomes a challenge here in the same way that there are, we have penalties for attempted murder, even though someone is, has a bad shot, we still say that was a bad thing to have done. Uh, I see an opening. <laughs> I'm a little worried about what kind of opening you see. Uh, I don't think we can use the outcome. I don't think we can use the outcome as the way we uh, we apply these sort of standards. I think we have to define certain acts that we believe are associated, on average, with better outcomes. Hand hygiene being one of them. Use of the timeout appropriately being another. That these are these are associated with better outcomes. If we say the only time we will call someone on their transgression, their failure to follow the safety rule, is when we can define that something bad happened to the patient. I don't think we can ever tackle this problem effectively. Greg? I believe that an over-focus on process measures is actually going to get us into trouble. That much of the accountability that my opponent speaks of focuses on trying to keep track of things that people do. But let's think about it. What captures the hearts and minds of our colleagues and of the patients and families we care for. It's the outcomes. How much time are we gonna spend on policing hand hygiene rather than looking at MRSA rates, rather than having patients come in front of our boards and explain what it was like to get an infection in our hospital? That's how we're gonna move safety forward. And so this focus on process measures in the short term is actually taking away the joy and meaning from the work on safety that will really capture the hearts and minds of our colleagues. We need to focus on the important outcomes and not get dragged down by trying to keep count of checked boxes. Next question to Greg. How do you think a lack of accountability will influence a culture of safety? I think we are all accountable for a culture of safety. I think the issue here is where do we place that accountability? That my opponent suggests that we need to put it at the sharp end. We need to have people on the front line feeling like they will be held, quote, accountable. They will be blamed for certain behaviors or lack thereof. But instead, we ought to focus on the culture. We ought to do that collectively. That means focusing at the blunt end looking at the policies and procedures that we have in place to move us forward. And again, I would argue that we will do much more progress over the time we have before us by focusing on a culture that moves away from blaming individuals to one that takes and is accountable for making sure that people feel free to speak up, that we take all those events seriously, and that we learn from them. Bob? I hear that a lot. I hear we are all accountable a lot, and it sounds good, but I actually don't know what it means. If there's no practical uh, manifestation of that term, we are all accountable. And I think there is no practical manifestation of that term if, in fact, people choose not to follow important and reasonable evidence-based safety rules and get away with it. I think it's, a, it's an empty term. OK. Uh, this question is a similar to a previous one, but I think it's an important point that um, I'm going to ask it again in a different way. Um, and I will uh, again ask Bob to begin. Can you differentiate between patterns of behavior and errors, omissions that arise under complex conditions? It's a little hard to parse that completely, but I think that that the issue of patterns of behavior is important here because there are certain things that we're talking about where it is a choice. For example, I'll take the, I'll I'll take the time out and, and, and recognize 
as Lucian recently wrote uh, in the New England Journal, that if things like timeouts are implemented in a way, in a poor way, without an attempt to change the culture, they, often, they may not work. But let's assume we have an organization that has decided to do a timeout, has worked on the culture, has worked on, on the leadership. The choice not to do a timeout in a given circumstance, to my mind, is a choice. And a single violation of that choice is important, noteworthy, and should be dealt with uh, by uh, a system of accountability. Uh, there are other situations that are, I think, grayer, where a single lapse doesn't really mean that the person is willfully choosing not to follow a safety rule. I think hand hygiene is a good example of that. We all forget to do it periodically. We have to work on systems that remind us better, but we will forget to do it periodically. So the issue there is what do you do to and with a person who chooses not to do this repetitively? It's not that they forgot once or twice. They just never do it, and they've made that choice, and their system basically says to them, that's okay, we're going to let you keep doing that. To me, that's unfair. To me, that's immoral. Greg? I think in many ways my opponent just answered the question because what you saw was a struggle to be able to differentiate. And I'll answer the question directly. No, we can't. We can't parse it out. We're not that good. We don't know enough to do so accurately. We will spend all of our time making decisions about whether or not something was, quote, a pattern or not, whether or not something was, quote, willful or not, rather than learning from the events and taking that learning and helping us improve safety. This would be a major distraction to our time, energy, and efforts, and you just heard about how difficult it will be to parse it all out. Our next question is for Greg. If you have the data and anecdotes that show variation in performance, is it not our moral obligation to have zero tolerance? I believe that it is our moral obligation to get better. We need to get better. And we would do much better at getting better if we instead focus not just on the low-lying outliers on one end of the performance curve, but celebrated more those who were performing at the highest level. That individual who does hand hygiene perfectly every time and who has low MRSA rates in their clinic, despite seeing 40 patients in an afternoon. That surgeon who, despite a busy schedule, does a wonderful preoperative checklist and has a terrific timeout. We need to celebrate them. We need to laud them in front of their colleagues. We need to get people excited about trying to emulate them rather than spending our time trying to hold the others accountable. I do believe if we do a good job of the former, of focusing on the positive deviance, we will pull the others up over time and we will not waste energy and effort when we could be celebrating the best. Bob? Uh, I join Greg in his call to celebrate the best. I think we should and I think uh, that will advance the cause. Uh, and I think it's an important thing that we need to do that we do not enough of, uh, but I think we can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. I think that one could envision a culture that looks like that, that celebrates the best, but also takes seriously people that choose to not follow uh, important rules. I think both of them are equally important parts of a, a positive safety culture. Okay, this is going to be our last question from the audience. Bob, directed to you. Should everyone be held to this level of accountability, or just doctors? <laughs> I thought that was going to get framed the other way, which is, should everyone be held to this level of accountability uh, except doctors? Because I think that's the way this usually plays out. That there are layers of accountability often built into HR policies and other mechanisms that I think are overly, often overly bureaucratic and sometimes overly punitive. And they are applied to certain classes of people. So certain transgressions that a nurse commits might lead to a certain kind of penalty, but woe is the organization that takes on the chief of neurosurgery, who's bringing in $5 million a year into the organization. And I think those sort of variations are soul sapping for an organization. So I think one of the key things here is whatever the rules are, that we decide as organizations that we are going to enforce, they are enforced equally for everyone, and that includes everyone, including the doctors. Greg? Let me ask you to read the question, and I'll explain the reason why. Please read it again. Okay. Should everyone be held to this level of accountability, or just doctors? And I think that question actually 
illustrates exactly the point of why this accountability quote would be so problematic. The reason why, think of how divisive that question is. Why would somebody ever ask a question like that? Because they're trying to start to pit the forces against one another. Because they're trying to undo wrongs of the past. We don't have time for that. Let's spend our energy and effort on learning and moving forward. Thank you both, and thank you to the audience for those great questions. Now we are moving into a portion of the debate where Bob and Greg will ask questions of each other. <laughs> you stay on your side of the field, please. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, ask that the questions themselves be limited to a minute, not, to, not speeches, but questions. Um, and we will have two minutes for the response, and then again a 30-second rebuttal. And so, Bob, I'll let you ask the first question. Greg, thank you for uh, engaging in this. I've learned a lot. I, I guess I would be interested you invoked talking to families. I'd be interested in how you, as the chief clinical officer of a large organization, would talk to the family member of a loved one who had a severe healthcare associated infection and knew that your organization's data showed that you had a 50% hand hygiene rate. I would make sure that we all knew, number one, about the consequences of what happened to that patient and also that our performance is lagging. We need to take advantage of that opportunity, and sadly, in this case, one involving patient harm, but we need and we owe it to that patient and that family to learn as much as we can from it. I think our obligation in that case is not to start to become the hand hygiene police, but instead to make sure that everyone in our organization knows that someone was harmed and that we have behaviors and we have norms that can improve it. We should be held accountable, but that accountability should be at the organizational level to keep us all moving forward and improving those hand hygiene statistics rather than singling out individuals. I would not take that as an opportunity to go back and conduct a witch hunt. I would take that as an opportunity to capture the hearts and minds of those who we work with every day. Bob, your response? I think the... Uh it's, it's an interesting response because being in that position myself periodically, I would have a hard time having that conversation. I would say, of course, that we're working on the positive culture that Greg invokes, that we're trying to improve the system, that we're trying to get people engaged in this. But I don't know how, how I would, with a uh, straight face and with credibility, say to a family member, we're treating this completely as a system problem and there is no penalty that we ever invoke to people that make the choice not to clean their hands after 10 years of working on this and improving the system. I think that's be a difficult conversation to have and I would want to be able to say if we can identify people that repetitively don't do this, uh, there are penalties. Okay, Greg, you can ask the next question, please. We do indeed have difficult jobs. Fear is a detractor from joy. How can my honorable opponent reconcile what seems to be conflicting messages coming from the Lucian Leap Institute? We talked last year about joy and meaning in work, but the notion that we have a sort of Damocles over us for whether or not someone really saw us cleaning our hands or from whether or not our timeout appeared to be as adequate as it ought to be will take away from that joy and meaning. Bob, how do you reconcile the notion that we're trying to restore joy and meaning as a mechanism to move safety forward and at the same time calling for accountability and reviving blame? Uh, that's a good question, Greg, and I agree that the notion of joy and meaning in, in, in our work is extraordinarily important, and I commend Lucian and the Institute for taking that on. Uh, but I actually care more about the joy and meaning of the patients and the families than I do about ours. Uh, I think that we have to balance making sure that we create work environments where good people want to be and can do their best work, but we also have to recognize that there are these other people who are mostly not in this room, and they are patients and families and advocates who look at us and see a failure to take on egregious acts and acts that represent flagrant violations of safety rules, and they don't understand it. They don't understand how we can 
avoid tackling this with the seriousness that it deserves, and they see our invocation of a no blame, it's the system, it's not anyone's fault, stance as being simply another case of professional circling of the wagons that we're, we're not taking on hard issues because they admittedly are hard. You've made that point yourself. I also think that it's a false dichotomy. I actually think one of the things that does sap joy and meaning from the work is to see one's colleagues who are choosing not to follow important rules. You're doing it yourself and you're asking the organization, why are we not taking this seriously? Why are yeah. we letting this go on? So I just, don't, I, would see, just, I don't see this I would as just note that in terms of rule following this morning, looking at our timekeeper here, um, <laughs> you, you are having a bit of difficulty, but just to make sure I've got my bases covered. Do, do, do you see this? Did you see that? Okay, write it down. <laughs> Greg, was that your 30 second rebuttal? <laughs> Consider it so. Okay, Bob, next question to Greg. Uh, I, was, I was going to ask what you were trying to accomplish with that suit, but I'm gonna lay off that question. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, I, I, let's keep it civil, please. Dark suit, <laughs> white suit. <laughs> I, I guess I would, uh, I'll ask, you, Greg, whether you uh, would pay your taxes and stop at every stoplight if you knew there was no threat of audit or tickets, and probably more importantly, whether all of the people that you know would do those things. I am a law-abiding citizen, <laughs> <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> but with that said, is the notion that by having some sort of accountability out there, is that going to improve our performance? And I guess for Exhibit A, I would ask you to drive down any of the freeways at your home and see what you observe there. Now, on the other hand, we need to have some rules. But again, I believe that those rules ought to be focused on the collective. We ought to have a rule to ensure that everyone is being open about the mistakes that they make that we want to ensure that people feel comfortable in speaking up about the fact that, you know, I was rushing to, to work today because I was late with the kids and had to get to a meeting and I was speeding. I'm going to get better for that. The notion of creating a police, and we've alluded to that a number of times over the course of the morning, I think is one that would be an incredible distraction from the work that we're trying to do. Should we have rules? Yes, indeed, we need to have those rules. Should we be held accountable for those rules? Yes, but we should be accountable as a profession, as a group of caregivers. We should be accountable to our patients and their families. Does that mean, at the end of the day, that we need to blame individuals and to mete out some sort of punishment? I don't think so. Well, I guess I'm not sure what a rule means if there's no penalty for failing to follow it. It's kind of like a guideline. <laughs> and I'll give back the rest of my time. <laughs> Greg, your next question to Bob. Bob, it's become popular to say that when we look at patient safety, our progress has been slow. And I'm as impatient as anybody, for those that you know me. But when I think about where we were back maybe in 1999 when Terrace Human came out, or if we go back to even the publishing of, of Lucian's first studies, I always think back to a slide that I see, that I use often, of looking at progress in naval aviation over five decades to make sure that carrier landings were safe. And when I use that as my comparator, I'm impatient, I wish we were moving faster, but my goodness, how far have we come? We need to celebrate that. And my concern is that your proposition would actually decelerate that progress. That if we brought blame back into the discussion, that's where we would spend all of our time and we wouldn't be continuing on that journey. I believe, again, that the cup is half full. We've done some great work, but how would your proposition move us forward? 
I believe it would. I believe that we are capable as leaders and as people who are committed to making safety better uh, of figuring out ways of invoking these sort of standards when the circumstances are right. And I think we do have to be careful not to go overboard. I think we do not want to create an environment where we lose the progress we've made by thinking about no blame and invoking systems. Uh, but as I hope I've, I've tried to make clear, I think that this is the way that we move to the next stage of our field. Uh, it was a good way to start to invoke no blame all the time, but I think we're capable and I think we're good enough leaders to figure out how to get this balance right. Leadership is hard. At this point in time, as leaders, we're being called to really stand up against what I think is an option to demonize our human frailty. Again, the temporal personal joy we would get from holding people, quote, accountable will just extract too high a price from us in terms of moving us forward on safety, of pulling away from the learning that we could have if we stick to the blame-free route. It's very difficult as a leader to stand up to the calls for accountability, but it's important that we do so. Bob, your question, next question for Greg. I think one bit of pushback that people sometimes give, and I think you've given it away around uh, invoking uh, a more accountable approach, is that systems need to be improved. The hand hygiene system could be better. I guess the question is, when do we say that the system is as good as it should be? Uh, you mentioned production pressures. There will always be production pressures. I think, I guess I, my question is, it, would there ever be a point where you would say the system's as good as it can be, and now we expect all of you folks to follow these rules? The question of whether or not there is this threshold where we could absolutely make something absolutely fail safe um, to pokey yoke it for those of the engineers in the audience here in a way that we could never undo it. When will we actually say that it's fine to hold folks accountable? I think back on an experience I had when I was at HRQ when I was asked about a patient safety event that took place on Long Island, which involved individuals actually using duct tapes to hook up the wrong gas lines um, to an anesthesia machine. Um, the reality there was, was that yes, that even with a, quote, perfectly designed system, that there was still that temptation, there was still that drive, and when those individuals were asked why they did it, production pressure was a piece of that. And so at the end of the day, I do believe that the real enemy is production pressure. It is not our human frailty, and we need to continue on that focus. We don't need to be distracted by, quote, holding people accountable here, what we need to do is we need to continue to improve those systems and recognize that human frailty will always trump it. To err is human. Bob? I wish production pressure could go away, but I can't see it happening. And so I think we're always going to find ourselves in these, uh, in these circumstances. Greg said many times that leadership is hard, and I feel for him. He's got a difficult leadership job and, and a large organization, uh, but nobody cares. <laughs> Thank you. I realize that. I think they see those of us who are lucky enough to have leadership positions as being compensated well for them, uh, being given a remarkable opportunity to make a difference. And part of that is, yes, it's hard. We've got to make some hard calls. And to me, this is one of them. Okay, last question, Greg to Bob. Bob, one of the things that we always need to be concerned about is, is to make sure that we are being wise stewards of the resources that are afforded us. And the question I have for you is, when you're meeting with your CFO and you're asking for resources to improve safety, what argument do you want to be making? Do you want to be asking for resources to improve your event reporting systems? Do you want to be asking for resources to do more root cause analyses and looking for contributing factors? Do you want to be asking for more resources to improve underlying systems? Or do you want to be asking for the three FTEs it's going to take to keep track of hand hygiene to be able to have enough accountability in your system? What is the argument you want to use and how do you best use those scarce resources? I think that's a good question, and I think that that's part of our job as leaders to figure out how best to deploy our, our resources. 
I actually do, we're already spending those three FTEs watching hand hygiene. That's something we already do. The issue is we have no accountability loop to get back to people, make sure they're doing it correctly, give them an opportunity to improve, look at what they're doing to improve the system. And I think the additional FTEs that it might take to say, you now, we've watched you a fair number of times, and this is now the fifth time you chose not to clean your hands, you can no longer practice for a while until you figure this out. I don't think that takes additional FTEs. I think that takes additional courage. Greg. Thank you. I think that argument is actually one, again, where the courageous decision is to hold fast, is to recognize that we need to continue the focus on systems. It has brought us a long way. We have a long way to go. And I don't want to be asking for those FTEs on the police force. I want to be asking for those FTEs on the improvement force. Thank you to both of you uh, for excellent questions. We are now ready for final arguments from our two debaters. Each debater has two minutes. Bob, please begin. Well, I want to thank uh, Tejal. I want to thank the program chairs. I want to thank all of you for terrific questions and your engagement. I most of all want to thank Greg for a terrific debate, and, and uh, uh, he's someone I respect immensely. Uh, I noticed during the debate that he quoted poetry, he quoted Shakespeare, he quoted the Bible. I, on the other hand, quoted Arnold Schwarzenegger and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Not bad for a girly man. <laughs> but I feel pretty good about it because, as I told you about his military background, I had a low bar for success, and it was basically having a pulse at the end of this hour. <laughs> and the fact that I'm still alive, I consider a small victory. Uh, sometimes, we well, talk all the time about being a learning organization, and what a learning organization does is learns from what it has done and tries to improve. I think we started off our work in patient safety with absolutely the right notion, because we needed to get the hearts and minds of all of our, our workers, and the no-blame approach was right. But over time, having a full-throated embrace of the no-blame approach, I think has steered us down a dark alley. In an increasingly transparent world, no-blame may seem right to leaders, because the alternative is hard, as Greg says. It may seem right to many of us, but it will seem wrong to patients and their, and their families. And I think that they will see it as our effort to protect ourselves, protect our tur turf, and circle the wagons. And Greg talks about the concerns that we have that the consequences of having more accountability will be negative. I go the other way. I think the consequences of not having accountability will be negative because it will inevitably invite more and more regulation, more and more outsiders looking at us and saying, you folks are incapable of self-policing, so we will do it for you. I think that is far worse than where we are now, and that's why I think it's so important that we change. Greg, your final comments. I fear that when you're looking for that light down the dark alley, what it is is it's the blame train, and it's coming at us, and it's going to knock the patient safety movement back by many, many years. As I argued before, the reason why we need to oppose the proposition is because this notion of bringing blame back into the equation ignores our humanity. It flies in the face of safety science. It doesn't work. It's impractical. It drives the wrong behaviors and drives the wrong decisions about resources. And overall, it's a distraction. This Congress is about keeping focus. We need to keep focus on a harm-free, blame-free environment as our goal. Although my worthy opponent has treated us all to an hour of unadulterated oratorical flair, and to that I am grateful. So thank you, Bob. Thank you, Tejal, <laughs> for, your, uh, for your moderating. Um, for this, we're grateful for entertainment value alone, because at the end, we have to ask ourselves the question, is accountability, is reviving blame the means with which we're most likely to achieve success and make progress 
on a quest to create a world where patients and those who care for them are free from harm? I don't think so. I beg you support the opposition. Thank you. So we're ready for our next audience question. During this debate, has your mind been changed? A, yes, and B, no. Okay, so. Madam Moderator, could, at this point in time, could I ask that we actually insert another question? That would be, uh, of the two of us, who is nattierly dressed? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it Greg or is it Bob? <laughs> Okay. I got to win something today. <laughs> All right, and now we are ready for our last audience question. Back to our first question. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Certain safety practices should be inviolable and transgressions should result in penalties, potentially including fines, suspensions, and firing. A for agree, which was Bob's argument, and B disagree, which was Greg's argument. Can I request that these are risk adjusted? <laughs> <laughs> and you can see comparative scores from our first answers, despite all the minds that were changed, which is interesting. Um, we ended up with very similar final percentages. Uh, so Bob, I hereby deem you the winner of this debate. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to be very really proud, it. <laughs> very proud of this honor, and you can wear this proudly I for will. the rest of the Congress. Absolutely, I think thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, I, I think um, I'm pretty sure that it's a rule at the Congress for which we will be held accountable that all prize-winning hats must be worn throughout the entirety <laughs> of the Congress. So, congratulations, Bob. Let's thank our two debaters. That's right. <laughs>